would like to introduce Dr. Cummings, who is uh, going to come up. I already mentioned that he is chair um, and organizer for our community outreach program. But he also has a very active laboratory here. Um, he's the vice chair for research in neurosurgery. And um, he's going to tell you a little bit about the broader issues of stem cells, hype and hope, and, um, and stem cell clinics. Uh, and things that you may need to know about that. All yours. I'm going to skip the background information because she's already spoiled my, my title and just jump right to my disclosures, which is I have not a lot to disclose. I'm funded by the National Institutes of Health, by the Department of Defense, um, by CIRM, and also by some gifts from uh, private uh, corporations, stem cell companies, but I'm not going to talk about any of those private gifts tonight. I'm really only going to be talking about how do we tell that a clinical trial or something out in the public that you want to partake in is a valid uh, piece of science. And so in order to do that, get my, my slide advancer. So in order to do that, I'm first going to remind you of this tree of life that uh, Dr. Anderson talked to you about. And the important part about that is, is that you go out in the public and you'll read that we can take your fat cells and we can cure multiple sclerosis. We can cure Alzheimer's disease. I don't think so. Uh, but it has to do with the basic biology of stem cells. So we'll talk a little bit about that. Then we're going to talk about the difference between FDA approved trials or approved products versus an authorized trial. And there's a key difference. And then versus everything else. Uh, I'm going to show you how you can go online and try to find those trials and evaluate them, what preclinical data is, how you can look for preclinical data on your own or bring it to your doctor's office and discuss it. Uh, then we'll move on to the effect uh, size of an experiment and levels of evidence. And following that, I'll give you at the end a checklist uh, that you can use to decide if the risks are, are worth the potential rewards of any given stem cell trial. So we return to this tree lineage. And as Dr. Anderson was pointing out, at the bottom here, a cell can turn into anything in the body. But as we move forward, this cell has now been instructed to become mesoderm. And it's going to be maybe some type of visceral organ. And then as the body develops, it in fact becomes pericardium, or the outer covering of the heart. So once it's gone through this mesoderm instruction process, it can't magically go backwards and become brain tissue. So one of the issues is that you'll see clinics are promising that their cells can cure anything. And that's, that's of, of concern. So that's just the basic biology. I've just taught you everything you need to learn about stem cell lineage and, and basic biology. That's it. So the problem, how do patients or their doctors know what's real? And so this is an example from 1989. It's Fanconi's anemia, which is a genetic disorder. And doctors had the clever idea that if we were to take the umbilical cord blood from a tissue-matched sibling, maybe we could do a uh, graft into the sibling who had the genetic disorder, and we could cure them. And why am I telling you this? Well, because it worked. This person here is actually the first recipient of that type of uh, stem cell transplant, and it cured them. This is 30 years later. They're still alive from a lethal disorder. So that's how you can innovate and think, uh, a clinician can think, well, I understand this about biology and this about stem cells, and put the two together, and this might actually work. And they went and did this experiment without doing the experiment in an animal first. Uh, a different example, that should not have jumped ahead of itself. Let me try that again. A different example is this girl here, who, um, her name is uh, Evangelina Valcro, and she had a immunodeficiency disorder so that she was gonna have to live in a bubble. She had no immune system. And uh, scientists funded by CIRM, so this is on CIRM's website here, did a lot of preclinical work, and they were able to cure this little girl. Uh, again, I, this is just jumping ahead of me and not working right. So I apologize. We cured some people, but we used a lot of basic science to get to this treatment. Uh, conversely, we're running into people who are selling you unicorn tears, let's say. Uh, the old term for that was snake oil. And so the rest of this talk is really how do we decide something snake oil or not, and uh, how do you avoid it? Okay, so why is this a problem? Well, this is from uh, a friend of mine, Lee Turner at University of Minnesota. Um, he's published work on 
the direct marketing of stem cell therapies to patients. And so there's a lot of companies out there. It's growing exponentially. And sadly, the Florida, California, and Texas are the states that have the largest number of direct-to-consumer uh, cell therapy clinics. Um, he's followed this up uh, with a recent publication in 2018 that is, will be linked at the, bot at the end of this talk that there's now over 716 clinical sites where you can go get a stem cell therapy. And I find that curious because I'm going to show you in a minute which cell therapies are actually already approved by the FDA. And we wouldn't possibly need 716 clinics to do all of that work. So here's an example, though. This is also from Lee Turner's work of what are these clinics promising people? So anything in green here is a neurological disorder. So I'm a neuroscientist. I actually do uh, have done work on, on um, stroke and Alzheimer's disease, spinal cord injury, where, in fact, a uh, cell therapy that Eileen Anderson and I worked on uh, went to a clinical trial. So this is an area I know quite a lot about. And there are several legitimate clinical trials for these indications. None of them are going to be found at a clinic down the street. They're going to be found at academic research centers. Um, and conversely, there's nothing for COPD and heart failure that has been through FDA clinical trials. Yet, this is what is being advertised out there if you look at Dr. Google and search the web. So what could possibly go wrong? Well, the cells could remain pluripotent. What does that mean? They could turn into any cell in the body. The cells might remain in a proliferative phase and form a tumor in the patient. Maybe if you took someone's fat cells or their bone marrow and you stuck it into their eye to treat a, an eye disorder, you'd get something uh, that doesn't belong in the eye. So we could get, end up with brain tumors uh, on accident. Maybe the product contains contaminants, and this has happened, that you produce a batch of uh, cells for a transplant, and the cells are contaminated with bacteria. You inject that into five or six patients, and they all become infected. Some of them have to have been hospitalized and have organ failure. Uh, a patient could be excluded from a future legitimate trial. So if they go off on the street and go to an unauthorized clinic, get a therapy of some kind, and it doesn't work, and now they come back and they want to be in a, a clinical trial sponsored by an academic research center, they may be excluded from that trial. And obviously that's a problem. Also, these patients are paying $5,000, $10,000 for an injection, and this is a, a waste of money. Most people can't afford to throw away that kind of money. Um, and it affects the public trust. So we have a loss of public trust. Um, this is an example of women that were uh, given an, an injection uh, into the eye, and these individuals had macular degeneration. They got a cell therapy of adipose or fat-derived cells put into their eyes, and they were blinded. And in fact, this clinic injected both eyes at the same time, so they were thoroughly blinded, not just blinded in one eye. Um, another example is there's uh, fake news out there. This individual and this company, Geostar, were claiming that they're affiliated with UCLA and UC Irvine, and in fact, they're not. But they're out there marketing their product to people as if they are on the faculty at a university. So you need to check their resources. And this last example I'll give you is an individual named Jim Glass. Jim had a stroke and was partially paralyzed from this stroke. He went through rehab and recovered, but he had a lot of weakness in his legs, which is not unusual. So he had a leg weakness, and he wanted stem cell therapies. He went to China, he went to uh, Russia, and he went to Argentina, and he got multiple cell transplants at a cost of over $300,000 of his own money, not supported by um, uh, any insurance. And those stem cells, in fact, paralyzed him. They formed a tumor, and the doctor who did an operation on him to find out what was going on said he'd never seen a mess like that before. So if you're still not convinced there's a problem, I have something I can sell you. Um, stem cells, uh, we can turn people who are 50 into 30 years old. And my personal favorite, the first ever stem cell bra. So this is actual marketing material sent to the former director of our stem cell center. And the only reason why they didn't fall for it is because they was a he. So um, there's a lot of marketing out there. And you be, you're being bombarded with advertisements to take part. So now we're going to skip gears and say, what is an FDA-approved trial. So FDA-approved means that a new drug and certain biologics must be proven safe and effective to the FDA satisfaction before they can be marketed to individuals. So anything, any product that is FDA-approved has gone through the rigorous clinical trial process. 
okay? Four FDA-approved products, and in biologicals, we're talking about proteins, vaccines, or cell therapies, blood and blood products. There's a website you can go to and look up what these products are. You don't have to write this down. It'll be in the handouts at the end, or it'll be on our website. So there's a website we can go to, and it assures that they are making use of the proper manufacturing standards, and let's go to that website. So this is the link to the website. We'll go look at every approved cell therapy for a biologic. Are you ready? Here they are. Watch them scroll by. There's fully 17 of them. That's all, not 761. There's 17 of them. Eight are for cord blood. So of these 17 products, some of them are cell lines, T cells, or gene or viral therapy. Only eight are stem cells, and those eight are all cord blood for reconstitution of blood in leukemias and in myeloblative therapies. So the cord blood can make cells of hematopoietic or blood origin and are used and are FDA approved for that use. And that's it. There are eight approved cell therapies. All right, so if it's not already approved, and you can go to that website and look if there's nine or 10. Last time I did this talk, there were 16, now there's 17. But the eight for uh, cord blood is still the same. We can also look at, well, you know, how do clinics that we're talking about out in the community, how do they get around this? And the reason they can get around it is that the FDA has guidelines saying that if something is minimally manipulated, that means it is processed without altering its biological characteristic. You merely take fat out, spin it down, and separate it, and put it back into the patient. That's minimally manipulated. The product has to be for homologous use, meaning it's supposed to do the same thing from where it came from as when you put it back in. It doesn't have a new use. And it has to be for autologous use. Autologous meaning self. And so it has to be taken from you, minimally processed, and put back into you. It can't be given to a third party. And if a clinic adheres to these rules, they're avoiding having to go through a FDA authorized trial. So the reason why I bring that up is that this is the agreed upon timeline of about 10 to 12 years to taking a drug molecule and getting through the clinical trial process. So what is that process? There's preclinical research or what we call basic science at the bench top in animals. Um, that research then gets peer reviewed. If you find something of interest, you might file for an FDA new drug investigation uh, for a new drug authorization to test it in a clinical trial. Then that trial gets approved and there has to be local review board, ethical review of that trial and consent to take that uh, trial. And then you go into phase one, two, and three clinical trials. And Dr. Bode is gonna talk a bit about what those mean and how we do those here at UCI. If all of this works out well, you end up with an FDA-approved product. But not if it's mentally manipulated. You, had, you can skip all of that stuff. All right? So now, what if you actually want to go through the process, you have a cell therapy that you think is useful, and you want to be authorized to do a clinical trial? Well, you can look at a registered clinical trial database, and I'm going to show you that right now. And this database shows all of the clinical trials available, not just in the US, but in, in the, the whole world, are all registered on this one site. But this site is not like a pharmacology or biological database. So if you look up a drug in a drug manual, you'll see all the authorized drugs that are there. But these biologics, anybody, anyone can register a trial at this site. In fact, the three individuals who are blinded in that trial in Florida for in their, with the uh, fat cells into their eye, that trial was registered on clinicaltrials.gov. And two of those patients said, I went to clinicaltrials.gov and I saw the trial was listed, so I, I assumed it had to be real. So that's a very cautionary note. So let's look at this database. Um, here is the website, clinicaltrials.gov. And uh, I was showing this to Dr. Boda, who's obviously quite familiar with it, but she said, yeah, but it has a disclaimer right here. I said, well, yes, there's a disclaimer, but it's not highlighted. That, that's what it should say is warning. Here's the warning that any trial listed here is not actually evaluated by the US Food and Drug Administration. So you can go to this site and type in something. I'm a traumatic brain injury 
uh, neuroscientist. So I'm going to type in stem cells and traumatic brain injury and hit go, and I get this list. So this is the nine registered trials. I, I Sorry, I limited that to the United States. So in the U.S., there are nine trials advertised or uh, on this website of the uh, uh, National uh, Library of Medicine. And of these trials, we see that three of them are from a company called Salvation, and I'll come back to their preclinical work in a moment, but there's, a, there's an actual company called Salvation. They've had several clinical trials of their product uh, in repetition or expanding on their trials. There's one listed here by SanBio, and you're gonna hear about that one because it happened partly here at UCI. So a SanBio trial is listed. There's two of them that are listed by the National Institutes of Health, but these are not a cell therapy, they're a gene therapy trying to affect stem cells. That's why they popped up in this search, but it's not a transplant study. And that leaves one here and one here, and you'll notice the green word, you probably can't read that in the back, but it says these trials are recruiting patients still, and they're from the Healing Institute. And this trial here says it's going to treat neurological disorders, neurodegenerative diseases, and 17 other disorders. Hmm, that should be a clue. But if it's not clue enough, you could Google the Healing Institute and find out they don't exist meaning there's not a company website with a bio of who the scientists are, where their manufacturing is, or any of that useful information. Awful uh, curious. And a similar case with this last one, Regenevita, which is not actually enrolling right now. So even an educated scientist looking at this site isn't quite sure what to make of all the trials that are listed there. So what should one do? Obviously, we start with, is the trial listed? as being authorized by the FDA. And you start the search online, but it's not easy. So what I just showed you took me quite some time to do. So you need to ask the lead investigator for a copy of the FDA authorization. There is a website you can go to. Uh, it's really useful. I'm showing it to you right now. The Bioresearch Monitoring Information System, also linked at the end of this lecture. If you go to this website, you can't search by trial ID number. Why? I have no idea why. It makes absolutely no sense. But you can search by the investigator's ID number. Well, I don't know what the ID number of the investigator is who's leading the trial. But if you happen to find that information or know their name and address, you can search this database and try to find trials that are actually authorized by the FDA. Otherwise, when you look at clin clinicaltrials.gov, it's hit or miss. What are the supporting documents available? Is there institutional rev review board approval for informed consent? What's the trial design? Is it open label? Is it randomized? Are there peer-reviewed publications in support of this trial? So I'm gonna show you an example of that in a moment, but this is free. You can go online and search and see, is there preclinical data that supports this concept? Go to PubMed and check for publications. Uh, where is a trial being done? Are the trial sites reputable? Do a separate Google search on the trial sites and see what you find. Who is leading the study? So you'll see on clinicaltrials.gov, it will say who the lead investigator is or who the company is, and then you can Google that person and see, are they actually an expert in traumatic brain injury? If they are, then you know, that's more, I, I'm more likely to trust that than if they're just a random physician who has no background in the therapy that they're trying to provide. So check their bio on the academic websites and on PubMed. And then who's sponsoring the trial? Is it a respected company or an academic institution or is it some nutraceutical startup company or some company that's only been around for a year or two and you don't know much about it? So the bottom line is clinicaltrials.gov can be very misleading and you have to do a lot of background research to uncover what's going on. So I mentioned go look at PubMed and look for peer-reviewed scientific publications. So how do you evaluate that? Not all papers are created equally. And sadly, even in the academic world, there are now fake journals. There's fake news, there's fake journals. I get ads all the time. Dr. Boda and I were just talking in the elevator coming up. I'm just, we get emails every day to submit a paper to a journal that is um, a fee for publication journal. So the danger is, if you go online, you might find a publication and think that there's a, a paper published about this data and that I'm, I should go to this eye transplant institute. But in fact, it's not in a reputable journal. So what do you do? You need to find out if it's peer reviewed. You can check that on the journal's home web page. You can check the impact factor or the quality rating of the journal. You can look at how many times the paper 
or that author of that paper has been cited? Is this something that is uh, in agreement with other scientists in the field? Um, you can use web-based tools to search for supporting information. So these will be linked at the end, but there's ResearchGate, Google Scholar, and the PubMed site I'm going to show you in a second. So there are ways you can search to look at what is the background evidence. This is publicly and freely available. It's called PubMed. And any, anyone in this building probably uses PubMed every day. Uh, let's do a search for some very reputable scientist who might study traumatic brain injury. Uh, I'm just going to type something in there like uh, Cummings, BJ, stem cells, and spinal cord injury or TBI. And I come up with a whole bunch of papers that we're not going to look at them all. They're not really that interesting. Let's just click on one. So you could do this at home. You click on one paper, and up it pops. Oh, pushing the wrong button again. Sorry. Up pops the paper. And you can then look at that paper. And one thing you can do is read it yourself. Now, I'm killing myself here. Uh, it's this fancy clicker. So let's look at the paper one last time. Now I'm really bored with my own work. <laughs> Click the paper, touch no further buttons. <laughs> and here we see, here's the paper. You can download it for free. I don't want to do that. I just want to read the abstract. That should summarize it all for you. But here's what you really want to look for. In this corner here, it's been cited 18 times by other scientists. So if it's been cited by no one, maybe it's not a very reputable uh, piece of information. So you have to do a little bit of uh, your homework there. Now, what are levels of evidence? So we're going to go backwards from not very good evidence, or what we call level 5 and level 4 evidence. This is from a single case report, or maybe it's an expert opinion piece, but it doesn't have any data in it. Uh, a level four bit of evidence would be there's a series of case studies. I saw three or four patients, and they all had this similar condition. So we'd call it a level four of evidence, not something I'd want to uh, decide to get a stem cell therapy based on. Level three is a moderate level of evidence from a retrospective study, meaning looking back in time at a group of individuals, or a case-controlled study separated by the presence or absence of a disease. Not very common if you're looking at cell therapy where you have to have given an intervention, but it's possible. Uh, level two is uh, another moderate level of evidence obtained from prospective cohort studies where the patient groups were separated but non-randomly. And then the gold standard of the strongest evidence is a prospective, meaning looking forward, you're separating individuals into two groups, you're doing double-blind, randomized, controlled studies, and if that's done with follow-up of greater than 80%, that would be level one evidence in support of a certain uh, cell therapy, certain drug, or whatever you're interested in. So you can evaluate what is the level of evidence or ask your physician, what's the level of evidence that supports the use of this, this therapy that we're talking about? So Dr. Anderson brought up this bench to bedside um, valley of death. Um, I mentioned at the beginning that Falcone's um, anemia. This is another example of innovation where uh, in the late 90s, people were taking high dose chemotherapy for women with metastatic breast cancer and giving them autologous bone marrow transplants because if you give them high dose radiation, you're damaging their um, immune systems, their blood system and damaging their bone marrow. So if we were to give them an autologous or give them their own b bone marrow back, the thought was we might actually reduce some of the symptoms of the high-dose radiation. So this made sense, um, and, but it wasn't based on doing an experiment in an individual animal. Uh, but in fact, it, this was one of the examples of we're taking an innovative therapy that offered hope. And in, it turned out that over 30,000 women received this high-dose chemo and autologous uh, bone marrow transplants which were later shown to be ineffective or, in fact, harmful. Uh, and Dr. Boda can talk more about that. I'm not the clinician, but this didn't work. It made sense, but it didn't work. And so this is why a lot of us work on what we call the basic science, or how to translate basic science into a clinical trial. Not that innovation isn't a big part of medicine and something clinicians have to do. But at the bench top, what we're doing in this building is trying to figure out can we do something in a model system, replicate that in a controlled study, and then take it to a clinical trial? So I'm just giving a, a very brief example here. This is from animals that have traumatic brain injury in my lab. If we put the animal into a swimming pool that is clouded with uh, a milk, milky paint 
and there's a hidden platform you can barely see there, the animal can't see that platform. So if we put the animal in and they learn the task, they have to figure out where is that platform. Once they find out where the platform is, and this is that same animal, but five days later, and the animal has learned to swim right to that platform. So we could then ask the question, if we give them stem cells, um, does that improve their ability to learn this task or not? Um, we can actually map what those learning patterns look like. And then this is the only basic science data I'm going to show you tonight. Um, you're very fortunate. Um, look, we have a huge effect, meaning the animals that are sham animals or, or uninjured, they learn to uh, hang out where that hidden platform was for 30 seconds. Um, the animals that are injured but got a vehicle transplant, in other words, the placebo, those animals don't learn the task very fast. And the animals that got a stem cell transplant learn the task in a similar rate as the ones that aren't, aren't injured at all. So we could look at this as, oh, we almost cured these animals. I don't know if that means we're going to cure a person with TBI, but that's the hope. So the idea here is we're looking for big effect sizes. And so what does this mean? There's a mathematical formula that you don't have to do on your own. Um, in fact, there's a website where I do it. I just punch my numbers in. But the idea is that as you see a difference between the means and less noise in the data set, you have larger and larger effect sizes. So now we'll go back and I'll show you these first two examples here where there's no effect size or a large effect size. This is from the study that powered the Salvation approved or authorized clinical trial. So Salvation is giving uh, autologous um, bone marrow derived stem cells to uh, pediatric and adult patients with traumatic brain injury. The next two on this list here with a large effect size and a medium effect size are from the preclinical work that's published that SanBio did. And this data set led to the approval of uh, SanBio's product being tested in traumatic brain injury and for stroke. And that happened here at UCI. And, and Dr. Bodes could talk a little bit about that. And then uh, just because I have to, to um, toot my own horn a little bit, all of these following studies are with a product that CIRM has funded called Chef6. And this product has very large to huge effect sizes in our model of traumatic brain injury. I just glossed over six or eight years worth of research, but such is the case with the public lecture. Um, again, clicker problems. So. Would you like the operator error? No, 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 no. It's definitely <laughs> clicker problem, not operator error. So. Innovative care. Clinician scientists like Dr. Boda may provide unproven stem cell based interventions at most to a very small number of patients outside the context of a formal clinical trial and according to highly respected or restrictive provisions outlined in the International Society for Stem Cell Research is guidelines. This is not a legal requirement. This is what we're pushing for now in our, our stem cell societies is if you're going to do an innovative treatment that doesn't have basic science behind it, the least you need to do is follow a set of guidelines about IRB approval, informed consent, and reporting of the data that's found. Um, and you can go to ISSCR's website and see more of that. So the last bit I'll show you, because uh, this is a very hot topic now, is um, what about stem cell therapies for arthritis? So let's take what we've learned, we'll go back to PubMed, and we'll type in a meta-analysis or a group analysis of multiple studies of stem cells in arthritis and what's the level of evidence for this. And we come up with one meta-analysis that looked at 20 observational studies of which seven were randomized, one was prospective, and basically the bottom line, which we're not going to the basic science of this, but something called hyaluronic acid, which is not a cell therapy, um, is better than saline at six months. And of all these trials, one of them used mesenchymal stem cells, and it did it in six patients. That's the entire data set for mesenchymal stem cell therapies transplanted into a joint. And they found that the mesenchymal stem cells were safe and potentially beneficial. But the bottom line of this meta-analysis was, in fact, that efficacy is far from definitive and warrants further high-quality comparative trials. So there are, in fact, FDA-authorized trials for mesenchymal stem cells for arthritis that are part of a formal clinical trial program, not something that you get from a clinic down the street. 
So at present, there is no level one or level two evidence for stem cell efficacy for arthritis. So this is an example which we can get to at the end is depending on what the side effects are, what the risk is, what level of evidence do you need? If you're going to transplant something into someone's brain, that's probably much more risky than sticking something into somebody's elbow. You can always cut the arm off if you need to, right? So here's our checklist. Uh, part one is that stem cell products are not universal. And if someone claims a product treats everything under the sun, you should run in the opposite direction. You should understand and appreciate the difference between something that's FDA approved as an, an approved product versus an authorized trial trying to get to approval and pseudoscience or fraud. You should know how to identify valid FDA clinical trials for stem cells. I showed you it's really not that easy, but there, there are ways you can do it. You should check PubMed and Dr. Google for preclinical support of the um, claims for the therapy. You should discuss the levels of evidence with your physician and decide together if the risks of the therapy outweigh the benefits. And if you've asked to pay for a therapy, you're not in a clinical trial. So therapy needs to have level one or level two evidence if it's an invasive therapy. So with that, um, I will end with just a, uh, my favorite cartoon is that there's nothing a few stem cells and another 75 years of research can't fix. I say that it's kind of my favorite cartoon because in fact, it's much better than that. CIRM's only been around 10 years. And as you heard from Dr. Anderson, CIRM has funded 54 clinical trials to date. We're going to hear a few more of them from Dr. Boda. But before I leave the podium, I need to thank my fans. I mean, my lab. Sorry, they're not my fans. Um, I want to thank my lab because I get to give the public talk and be the, the talking head. But this doesn't happen without a whole lot of people's work. And I hope you noticed that I changed Cherie's name to Cherie Lepe because perhaps there's a relationship there. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so that's the end. Uh, I will just stick this up because this will be, is being videotaped and this will be on a website so you can see all these links. And as Dr. Anderson said, we'll be handing these out at the end as well. So I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Boda. Now, do you wanna introduce Dr. Boda? So it's my great pleasure to introduce then Dr. Daniela Boda. I can, if I can ask for everyone to hold questions until the end and then you can ask to your heart's content. Um, Dr. Boda is actually the, uh, I was going to say the Uber director, I don't know. So doc, Dr. Boda uh, is a, a clinical neuro-oncologist um, in terms of a research for anyone uh, who was here for our August lecture. Actually, she and I went in tandem speaking about glioblastoma because she's very unusual as a clinician, as an MD and a PhD. So she has both a basic science footprint and a clinical program. In addition to that, um, we have the great privilege here at UCI. Not only is she in charge of the new clinical trial initiative here, but she's also the clinical director director for the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic here. And that was, I think, one of the best decisions that was ever made in the center. So with that, Daniela, welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. So I have about 10 minutes to convince you that actually there is hope in stem cells. You just have to choose the right stem cells. And I always like the four letter word. If you live around me, you know that I say quite a number of them. So we're wondering if stem cell therapies actually are poised at some point to become a cure. And absolutely a lot of people thought that. It is so refreshing to see people coming from different political ways. And when the right wing from Utah agrees with uh, the Hollywood, then you know that you have a winner. Uh, as you can see, the diseases that we were trying to target, now that we are getting there, the diseases that everybody was hoping that will be able to help us are again many times neurological disorders, either because it comes sometime from Nancy Reagan and her hope for Alzheimer or Michael J. Fox and his help and support for Parkinson. But the idea that I love, it's what Michael J. Fox put in this quote which said, that the potential of stem cell research is so huge that if it succeeds, there is not one person in the world, in the country, that will not benefit or know somebody that will benefit. So that's very inspirational, makes me wake up every morning at five o'clock in the morning and trying to find time for doing another stem cell trial. And the way in which we want to do it, we want to do it here. We want to do it in the current political climate. 
So I have to get you guys a little bit on the story of the current political climate. So you know how we complain about those 12 years of research and how long it takes and how we never get to have treatments in the clinic. Oh well, in 2016, President Obama together with um, the Senate and decided that we need to accelerate medical products and actually it got voted and authority was given to the FDA to improve the amount of people and the amount of money that they spend in order to try to expedite product development for severe diseases. And we're gonna go there in a few minutes. And that part of the law was specifically targeted for a generative medicine advanced therapy. It was supposed to be, again, the four letter word, the CURE Act. But how was this regenerative medicine defined? It was defined as a cellular therapy or a tissue engineering products. Think about all those prostheses, think about all the artificial organs that we need. A human cell, a tissue product, a combination, but it was supposed to treat, modify, or cure a serious life-threatening illness. This was not for arthritis, though I know, you know it bothers all of us, occasionally, except of the little people in the back. But this was important, it was supposed to treat uh, diseases that are life-threatening and and this is that's why I left the end not because I knew that I don't have enough space it's one and two and three and you need the preliminary data you cannot go and ask to be accelerated if you do not have a therapy a serious illness and data so about 30 companies obtained this designation as of uh, middle of 2019. I gave this presentation in April for CERM and we are at 30 at that point. This is a short list. There are many of those that we are, that are in the room recognize that those again are neurological and cancer treatments and we are participating in a number of those studies. I'm going back and very fast over approved and allowed. This is like your children asking you, mom, can I have candies with dinner? And you have to decide if it's approved or allowed that my house is never approved and occasionally allowed. So the idea of approved is that the, the treatments that are approved are the hematopoietic stem cells that already were discussed, bone marrow transplants trying to cure hematologic disorders. Allowed, you also want to those criteria, are those cells derived from you minimally manipulated and given back to you. And I think we learned before that not everything that's allowed should be done, like you shouldn't have always candies at dinner. Now, what about the clinical trials? This is a difference that I also want to make. Being in the clinical trial, you are not, pro you are not proposed an effective treatment. I tell my patients many times that being in a clinical trial, it's an act of love. People are extremely generous participating on those studies. Even though those studies were reviewed by FDA, were in a way proven to have acceptable safety, they are conducted with consents and IRB review and boards of physicians reviewing other physicians. Those are not cured. Some of them maybe are gonna end up prolonging people's life, but in the end, this is science. They are experiments. Every clinical trial is an experiment, but it's an ethical, well-designed experiment. If it went through the steps through the, that we are supposed to take with the FDA and our own regulatory bodies. Now, what is compassionate use? I tell people many times that you know, compassionate use, it's even a bigger gamble. It's for patients many times that don't qualify for clinical trials. In my clinic, if somebody has advanced cancer and they cannot move as well as before, and they don't qualify for studies, they can qualify for compassionate use. It's still done, uh, done under FDA review and require applications. A new concept, and maybe you guys have heard about the right to try, there is a whole legislation under the federal as well as different state right to try legislations. They also require regulatory regulations and many states, not all of them, IRB consent. So when we talk about those things, we have to move to the next step. You are in a clinical trial, so what? Does it matter if it's a phase one, two, three, or four? Well, it matters for us and it should matter for you. Because if you're on a phase one study, probably the patient that was before you was one of Brian's rats. The phase one study, many of them are first in men 
And in our reality, what we are trying to do is to define what is the maximum dose that is safe and effective for the patient. When we get to a dose that is too high, meaning people start being sick from the treatment that we are giving them, we go one dose lower, and that dose is the dose that we're going to move on phase two trials. Phase two trials many times are open label. Many people like that because it means that you really know what you are getting. But the reality, you just got out of a study where we prove, maybe in 10 or 12 patients, that this is safe and that I'm not giving you a dose that is too high and is not going to make you sick. We don't know if it's effective. We have good science. We have cured a few rats and maybe even a few mice. If we are very lucky, a few monkeys. But we are still trying to find how does this trial go and works in humans. And this gets us to the phase three trials, which are wonderful. We have cleared the phase one, we have cleared the phase two, but now we are running that study that's going to give the level one evidence, which means that it's going to be probably double-blinded and placebo-randomized, meaning that they're gonna be a control group and a treatment group. The control group might get a placebo, and in addition to that, it's very possible that neither the patient nor the physician administrating the treatment in the clinical trial will know which one is which. That's the double-blinded part. The ethics of this are to be discussed. Part of the new uh, clinical trial designs from the FDA are trying to limit the number of patients that are going to go on the placebo designs. But that's a discussion for another evening. When everything was approved, and we are going now in the clinic, you are doing post-marketing studies, phase four trials. And people will ask me, why do you need phase four trials? I see a few gray hairs around here. Do you guys remember thalidomide? Approved for headaches and nausea on pregnant people. Wonderful thing. By that time, I don't know how anybody thought about the fact that that's actually a chemotherapeutic drug, which completely uh, bothers children development, embryonic development, and we had a lot of children born without limbs. So it's always important to find out what is the effect 10 years after you started, 20 years after you started. How many clinical trials we have? Oh, well, you can see that in 2000 was manageable, or just 5,000, but right now about 2017, the number is a quarter of million. And this goes back to the number of clinical trials on clinicaltrials.gov. So how do you manage a quarter of million studies? You can do it in different ways. One of the ways that you do that is by knowing the things that Dr. Cummings just talked about. I want to go back a little bit at the compassionate use and expanded access because this was a whole political discussion. And we need to understand what is what. This is a regulated mechanism, again, for patients with serious or immediately life threatening disorders on which there is no treatment available and there is an emergency. This might be, by example, and I'm making things up, but they are quite real. A young child that gets admitted with 30 or 40% burn on their skin surface. And there is no pediatric treatment for the children to replace that skin and the children is in danger of dying because those are severe burns. You can apply to the FDA if you have a clinical trial going at your institution and get an adult product to try to help that child. And you can do it almost immediately because it's an emergency. You don't have two months to wait. You can do it in a 24 hour interval. The right to try law was approved by the 115th Congress on May 30, 2018. And this law wants to um, improve access to unproven investigational treatments for, again, see, same thing, patients diagnosed with life-threatening conditions, which have exhausted approved options and who are unable to participate on clinical trials. And they need to be certified by a physician. All of those things are very different from stem cell tourism. You heard enough of that. The other horror stories that I can tell you about patients that were damaged by this. And it's very important to remember, this is uncovered by insurance. There have no evidences and not approved. In California, there is a California disclosure law, and this is very important. 
you have to have a disclosure on the Wallulio Clinic saying that your treatment is unapproved. So if you have the idea as you are driving in Orange County to go and have a treatment, a stem cell treatment for anything from heart attack to erectile dysfunction, please look on the walls and see if you see a sign saying that the treatment is unapproved. You don't even need to go to clinicaltrial.gov. It's big and it should be in red. Not only that, but you should get a statement saying that the treatment is not approved before your treatment begins. And the rule was that the state of California decided that the Californians should know that they're taking a risk. They're allowed to take a risk, I guess. You can, you know, jump out of a plane, but you are informed that that's not a safe procedure. So, when you do this, educate, educate, educate. Look at your informed consent. There should be a document. In my clinic, those documents have about 20 pages. They look like you are signing your house away or buying a new house. And make sure that you actually read that. There should be no small print and everything should be written at the level of elementary school. It shouldn't be hard to read. Ask to be in writing and ask to get a copy. And ask questions and make sure that they answer appropriately. It's your life. You don't want to be ashamed of asking questions. We talked about the FDA or other countries specifically approval. There are a lot of good studies in Europe. Make sure that they are approved by the EMA. The peer review publications, the ethics board. And also what was not included and I would like to talk about it is the disclosure of the investigator or the person offering the treatment. If I'm involved with the company that is doing the treatment, if I receive money from them, if I have shares in the company, that should be in the consent. Even more, I shouldn't be consenting patients if I have a conflict of interest that's severe. So if the person that owns the clinic also runs the study, they should be in the disclosure. So if you go to Dr. Jones' clinic and Dr. Jones is consenting you, that is already a conflict, but you should be asking about that. And I have many informed patients that ask me about that all the time. And in medicine, there is the sunshine law and there is a database where all those conflicts should be declared. So you guys heard about CERM. It's already 8.05, so I'm wondering if we should go or stop here. Go, okay, good. So I would like to go a little bit more in the details and show you some of the clinical trials that we run. And as you can see here, we are running a number of clinical trials in the CERM networks, the Alpha Stem Cell Clinics. We have six of them. It's, as you would expect, the University of California's. So I'm gonna go north to south, UCSF, Davis, UCLA, UC Irvine, and San Diego, and our production and colleague facility, City of Hope. And when we look at those studies again, we can see that we have cardiac studies, hematological studies, infectious diseases, neurological diseases, oncology, ophthalmology, and other. So I'm gonna give you a few examples of each so you'll understand what we do. And what I'm talking a lot those days about is um, genetic engineering. Because I'm so excited that we are finally getting that. That used to be Star Trek when I was a PhD student. Of course, you know, now you have other movies, better movies, but Think about the fact that you could have a disease copy. You could have, starting from the simple nursery, how now brow cow, I need some milk today. Your body, if you read that, will know that you need milk. What about your genes are now encoding? How now brow cow, I need some silk today. Could the cow give you silk? No, probably no. This needs to be corrected. And what we learn is that with a vector insertion, we can get the milk. With the zinc finger editing, we can remove the wrong message. But if we are using the CRISPR-Cas9 system, which is the latest in genetic engineering, we can completely correct the message. So now we have cures. We can cure based, at least theoretically, in the science that we have, single gene disorders. And there are numbers, about 200 single gene disorders, and some of them, I'm sure they are very familiar with for you. The hemophilias, the sickle cell anemias, the cystic fibrosis, those are diseases that killed people. 
And also in red, what you see there is the boy in the bubble disease or the girl in the bubble that you are seeing before, which are those very sick kids who have problems with their immune system that are condemned to live their room in a uh, their life in a sterile room. But the story that I want to tell you, because this relates a little bit with the story that you heard about the Chinese twins and CRISPR editing, is how can you take a very, very good, beautiful, wonderful idea and turn it bad? So news have been telling you that you can cure HIV using transplants. The reality is that the patients on which those uh, transplants are applied were patients that are already suffering of cancers induced of severe HIV. Those are called blood lymphomas. And they're one of the little events for people that develop AIDS. We have discovered some years ago that there are people that are resistant to AIDS. And the reason for which they are resistant to HIV and AIDS is because they don't make a certain protein, the CCR5, which is the Trojan horse that allows the HIV virus to get into the cell, infect the cells, and kill the cells. So you have two patients now that are compatible for a transplant. You can take the HIV patient and give a bone marrow transplant from the donor that is HIV resistant, and with the new immune system that's resistant to HIV, the patient can be cured. The problem, as you know, with bone marrow donors is that it's very hard to find somebody that's compatible with you, so many people don't have transplants. So what our colleagues at UC Davis started to develop is a mutation in a genetic engineering to induce a mutation on this receptor and then put it back on the patients where the cells came, and this is a functional cure for people with HIV. Why did I mention this? Because what was done in the Chinese twins that you guys read about, the first babies modified, was also to induce a mutation on the CRC5 in order to protect them from HIV. Guess what? That could have been achieved with the mom taking a few pills every day and not risking children to go through genetic engineering, which we don't understand and we don't know what are the deleterious effects later. So this is how a good idea can be used in a very bad way. Now I'm going to do the brag list. And the brag list, of course, is going to start to some of the work generated here. And I know that you talked about traumatic brain injury, but there is a lot of work done here on spinal cord injury, including the work done by Dr. Anderson and Dr. Cummins. And as it goes into, a into clinical trials, you can see here a person on a study. This person had the thoracic cord injury and could not feel anything below the nipples. And here you can see that after the treatment was the transplantation at the level of the injury. Now this type of patient can have impaired sensation, but sensation nevertheless, almost to the level of the groin. So this is a person that now can feel, and it's a person that can enjoy touch. And if we move to another study also, most of this work being generated at UCI, now, this is a treatment for cervical cord injury, and cells were injected in the cervical cord. When you have a cervical cord injury, what happens is that you cannot move your arms, you cannot move your legs, you are paraplegic and completely, quadriplegic and completely dependent on other people to help you. And in this study, which now is going to move to a phase three study, in the highest dose cohort, remember in the phase one, you have to go higher and higher, Four out of four patients have recovered at least one level in six months, and two subjects have recovered one motor level bilaterally, which means those patients gain the ability to use their arms and many times their hands. So this means that somebody that can use an arm now can use a wheelchair. It's not a cure, but it's a big change in the function and quality of life of a patient. Traumatic brain injury, we hear about it all the time, from the soldiers to the sport people to the children. Very, very common disease, about 5 million people being affected. The curse, it's coming. So if we look at this, this is a study that Dr. Groisman was involved in. What we are finding here is that the patients with chronic motor deficits treated with the cells had improved multimotor function over the control group. A sentence that's very interesting here is the one that was put on the SunBio website. 
And it said that this is a significant milestone. But interesting enough, this is the difference in approval. Because on this study was a phase two in the United States who never passed the master to go for an accelerated approval. However, in Japan, they're already filing for marketing approval. And this is a different discussion talking about differences between one country and the other. And how a study that here is seen as novel but worthy of a confirmation in Japan where the accelerating things can go for approval. And there are pluses and minuses on that approach. The same company has done a stroke study. And in this stroke study, we are also seeing that the treatment is well tolerated. And patients are actually having changes from the baseline, which are suggesting that they are slowly improving. So is that true? Is that real? Oh, well, it is. Because if you look here on this patient, you could see that the patient had a level of damage before, and that later, that level of damage in the brain is getting repaired. We can also treat amyotrophic lateral sclerosis in clinical trials. It's not a cure. We are not sure if it's going to work. Remember, those studies are still going. But this is one of the large studies that we are doing at UC Irvine as one of the centers. And what we are seeing is that patients with amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, uh, though they are still getting worse, they actually the treatment group is getting worse slower than the placebo group. And you can see this again here at two weeks, four weeks, eight weeks, and 12 weeks. People are still getting worse, but a little bit slower. That means a little bit more time before you make, need to make the choice if you want to go on a ventilator or not. So can we do that in cancer? We wish to do that in cancer, but cancer is very complex. It has stem cells, but you don't cure one gene. You don't try to replace one type of cell. You are trying to destroy a complex hierarchy while protecting the normal tissue. And sometimes we even need mathematicians in order to be able to write the complex mathematical equations that we are trying to do in order to model cancer. A simple way to think about eliminating those cancer stem cells is to find what is specific to those cells on their surface membrane that we can eliminate using immune therapies and try by that to slow down the cancer. This is a study that's going right now in our clinics for the glioblastoma. And we are using the tumor cells in order to make a vaccine to try to slow down the tumor growth and stimulate the immune response to eliminate the cancer. If you have a very good antigen, if you have something that's completely different, then you can come with those CAR T, those genetically modified T cells that now know specifically how to attack one antigen, one surface marker. Unfortunately, that's very rare. This is the only patient with glioblastoma that was cured by CAR T cells. So we have to decide what is the next idea in research that we can use in order to be able to offer some options to the cancer patients same way on which we did for neurological disorders and single gene mutations. So here I'm closing telling you that we can achieve remissions and hematologic disorders. We have lots of work to do in cancer. We can start to target chronic debilitating neurological disorders. Maybe there is a hope for some of those conditions from traumatic brain injury to spinal cord injury to ALS. And I hope I convince you that we do a lot of work here and that if you have any questions about any kind of stem cell therapy or clinical trials, feel free to send us a message through our web. If you want to participate on clinical trial, we have a web registry. So there are all kinds of ways on which you can collaborate with us and you can inform us. And remember, being on a clinical trial means that you also are moving the science forward. And with that, thank you, and we are happy to take questions. Uh, I, I hear on the radio and on TV uh, medical devices and treatments that claim to be FDA cleared. Is that a real term? Or is that simply marketing? Uh, there is a term of FDA cleared for devices. The equivalent of that means the device is safe. It means it's not going to burn you when you use it. It doesn't say anything about effectiveness. Dr. Cummings, you uh, described how we look for 
a study. Uh, I'm not a PhD in neurology. Uh, I'm not a PhD in library studies. But I just can't see how any normal person could actually find what you described without a week, maybe two, of trying to search where that information would be. So for the average person, it's not going to happen. So I'll repeat the question. Uh, how, could, how could a mere mortal actually do this? And the answer is, it's not easy. And I would say, for a clinician, unless it's their specific area of specialty, it's not easy. Um, I would respond, though, is that if, if you want to be in a legitimate clinical trial, you should be looking at academic research institutions, not mom and pop shops down the street. Um, and so I think the trouble is, and this is me not needing a cell therapy right now, people who want, who are in need of something, they want to believe there's a cell treatment out there. But there's such a wave of advertising um, and marketing to say, come and get our, our treatment. And we have uh, um, testimonials from the patients that feel they got better. But that's not a scientific trial. So I mean, the take home message would be, um, if it's not on the FDA's website, it's probably not something you should be involved in. But as I said, worse than that, even if it is on that website, there's still some more background you have to do. So the final thing I would say there is that at least we, we can hopefully agree that if you spent a week or two, you could gather some of that data. But I don't think this is something a person can do on their own. They should be doing it with their family, a doctor, um, or their family in general. People do more research on which car to buy than on what cell therapy to get. So you know, there's, there is a lot of homework that needs to be done. As a follow-up, I was asked to be in a clinical trial by uh, my oncologist at UCIMC who described clinical trials as a possibility for the cancer I had. Now I feel secure. I don't feel secure without an academic describing to me what the clinical trial was going to be about. So my advice would be to go to the oncologist, to go to the cardiologist, to go to a physician in an academic institution who can describe it in simple terms, but you have the trust that they've done the research. So I describe UCIMC all the time. Excellent. We appreciate that. And what I will also say is get a second opinion. And get a second opinion at a place, as you said, that you trust and a place that it's involved in academic research. And I'll also second the fact that if your physician is leading a clinical trial, what you don't see is the hours that that physician needs to train, certify, and the fact that we sign a form with the FDA that basically gives our life away. Because if we don't respect the ethical boundaries, then we are risking to lose everything that we work for, including our license and our freedom. Yeah, good thought. Uh, so I just have another question, just a follow-up with that question. So why the clinical trial doc gov, uh, 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 let out uh, so many misleading information? Could you do something with that? <laughs> would you like to start? Uh, I would uh, so why did the clinical trial.gov allow misinformation? So you have to understand that we are living in a time of freedom of press, of freedom of expression, and freedom of research. And it's important for us to stimulate research. I will also say that the FDA is cracking down and is cracking down hard on those misleading clinics, and it has just started. Uh, I was in numerous meetings with the FDA quite recently, and many experts were talking about the fact that it's the right time. You also have to remember that you have federal legislation and state legislation. And this is where I go back to CERM and to our direct efforts as directors in the Alpha Stem Cell Clinic to support legislation where we're going to have a committee of experts that will be able to go look at the information, look at the clinic, and start proposing clinics for being eliminated, or at least legal actions being taken against them. 
So I, I would like to add to that answer, though. How, how can these trials be listed on clinicaltrials.gov? And so part of it's political. Um, but part of it, I think, is that so some of us are trying to get together. ISSCR, I mentioned, was tried to have a program where they would certify whether a trial was met the right criteria or not. And they, were, uh, they shut themselves down out of fear of lawsuits. So there's a, there's a danger to saying this particular trial is unethical or bad or, or unfounded in science. Um, it's, they're not easy to make those decisions. And then the people whose livelihoods depend on it are going to challenge you. So that complicates things. We're hoping to actually use Google and the power of search to first, if you go to a, to have a, a website where you'd go to a website, type in your cell therapy and your disease indication, it would search clinicaltrials.gov, but would also be searching the clinical registries, the uh, IND filings, the names of the clinicians, the doing the PubMed search, and it would pull all of that together for you in one search. And so that would uh, simplify or unify things. But um, we don't have funding to do that. We have some volunteers that are interested in that, and hopefully we'll move forward with that, but it's gonna be complicated. There is a school of thought um, by many people that large pharmaceutical companies that make billions of dollars will never let a lot of um, new technology like the stem cells move forward because they would lose billions of dollars in drugs that otherwise would help, you know, cure. <laughs> So I have to let you know, and it's very sad, that running a stem cell therapy is actually more expensive than running a drug therapy, much more expensive, because many of the drugs are relatively easy to produce. Cellular therapies are extremely complicated to produce. Dr. Anderson and many of us are right now in the middle of putting together a very small facility of production for our own clinical trials and research work at UC Irvine. And though I don't have the final number, that very small facility, I think it's over two millions right now. And that's just refurbishing. Any clinical trial that I will show you, any cellular therapy that I took out right now, but the cure, by example, for thalassemia, it's 400,000. It can actually vary for other diseases up to $1 million. So the idea that it's free or it's cheap because it's made out of your own body, it's unfortunately not correct. And about the industry, it's, it's everybody's choice. Do you want to try a therapy that is not proven and is not safe, or do you want to try something that's safe and validated and go through the step to safely validate that? A clinical trial of phase three costs anywhere between 100 millions to five, four, four, five hundred million dollars. And the question is, do we want the government to pay for that, or do we want the partnership between industry and the government? So I was going to say that, that that's not really what I was kind of asking. What I was talking about is that the drug companies, I, I, look, look, right now I'm like 15 different doctors, and basically they all want to put me on pain medicine drugs, which, which I would be on forever, and it's not going to cure me, and it's making them lots of money, and they want to keep the cures away because they're making their billions of dollars on selling the drugs to just maintain you or the pain or whatever you're in. So I, I have maybe three points I want to make. So uh, the, 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 the comment here is whether pharmaceutical companies are sort of have a vested interest in going for drugs as a therapeutic, small molecules as a therapeutic that can be supplied over a lifetime, as opposed to something that would fall into the category of targeting a hematopoietic stem cell and making a genetic fix so that you truly have a cure. And there are certainly drug companies that have actively chosen that that um, conceptual framework for how to set their business. But I think it is also true that um, in that domain, um, of moving research out of the basic science, sciences on through translational medicine and into the clinic, there are a lot of startups that are into the game. And these are focused on new technologies moving forward with regenerative medicine. I don't think you could say there's been an absence of capital in that domain. I think the more complicated place that's kind of in between you and Dr. Boda is how do we price those therapies? 
because pharmaceutical companies want to make a profit. And at the end of the day, their reporting is to their shareholders, right? Brian and I, and certainly Daniela, have witnessed this firsthand in our collaborations with, with pharmaceutical companies and in moving things through to clinical trial. And that's where the rub is, right? Because some of the therapies that Daniela just cited that are in the $400,000 to 1 million per treatment for a, a cure range are focused on the idea of what someone would have paid if they had been on therapy for their lifetime, right? And so pharmaceutical companies, the model is, is in some cases organized around the idea of what could we have made if it had been a small molecule therapy as opposed to a regenerative medicine therapy, right? And some of us in the field would say that's problematic as a model, but I don't control how those companies work, right? What we can do with an academic setting is think about a little bit more of an idealized situation, if we can control a part of that process, right? And this is where my personal opinion is that organizations like the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, CIRM, are important. Then we can fund a large part of the drug development that is outside the bounds of what happens in a pharmaceutical company, right? Maybe set some parameters for how those clinical trials get done, run academic clinical trials that may be able to bring autologous cell therapies through to actual implementation as therapies, not just through the testing phase, right? And then be able to have some say as a society about how pricing works out, right? But we can only do that if we can drive the full clinical trial pipeline through what we do in academic medical centers. So I'm a strong propon proponent of academic medical center-based clinical trials and development all the way through the pipeline from basic science on up through the preclinical and translational work and into clinical testing for that reason, right? In the end, the price of all of these therapies, even things that are coming through as cures for 400,000 or $1 million a shot is going to drop tremendously. There's only so long the intellectual property on that will hold. And in reality, as the field moves faster and faster and our pipeline is accelerating for how to get there, how we can manipulate those genes, it's gonna open up that field quite a bit. But there's no question that there are many things that are gonna be a little bit priced out of the market for now. And then just one last comment there because I think it is important to understand that CIRM, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, actually has legislative requirements placed on it by the state of California about um, how therapies will be priced, how they will be made available to us as citizens of California and stakeholders trying to anticipate some of those issues. And I think that's going to be something that's very important to con continue to consider as we have 54 CIRM-funded clinical trials now, when those therapies move through hopefully into actually making clinical practice, the financial model for how that works and what companies can make is gonna be somewhat constrained by that legislation. I think that's gonna be an important move for the field. And, and there's cost sharing. So if we're successful with a TBI trial, the profits from that have to go back to the University of California and to CIRM so that more To, to more Californians, science to the state happen. as a shareholder. So I just wanted to make those points. I know that was kind of long-winded. Other questions? Uh, there are a lot of doctors that they, they do stem cell therapy. And also some new companies, they are selling stem cell. And uh, you hear doctors, they sell, we are buying from this company or we are purchasing you know, a stem cell and umbilical cord from that company. Who is controlling those companies that they are selling? And what is the, <laughs> you know, um, any control of uh, research of these uh, stem cells, <laughs> of th those babies <laughs> with uh, genetic disease or other? <laughs> the clear yeah. answer is no. And some of the things that uh, Dr. Cummins referred to, the people getting infected while getting IVs, are part of it the story of one of the companies selling stem cell therapies from cord blood. Those cells were unfortunately infected with um, fecal bacteria, and con the products contain dead cells and fecal bacteria. So as long as that product is not FDA approved, it doesn't have to pass through sterility, it doesn't have to pass through efficacy, it doesn't have to pass through all those tests, so it's buyer beware. What is the best source for stem cells? Is it umbilical cord, the placenta, the, your own cells? What is the best source? So I'm going back to what Dr. Cummings said. It depends for what indication. 
and could the cells become the cell that you are trying to replace? And depending on that question, the more undifferentiated the cell is, the more potential it has. Also, the more risk it has if it's not used appropriately. Yes, I would just say, A, I agree with Dr. Boda, that so if you need your blood remade, you, a, a bone marrow transplant cell product is a fine product for that, but it's, it's not going to make new brain tissue for traumatic brain injury. It might change the inflammatory uh, processes in your brain. So it's a, that the question, and I would, the, the first answer I would say is, we don't know what cell type is best for what particular disease. That's, we're in the infancy of studying stem cells and what the potential are. So, and, and that's actually, as a basic scientist, I've studied fetal-derived stem cells, um, embryonic-derived stem cells, induced pluripotent stem cells which are made from fibroblasts of adult patients, and we're comparing those different cells and it's kind of amazing to read out in the literature or out in the news that everybody already knows that IPS cells are the best. That's interesting. I don't, I don't know what cell type's the best, but we already have decided that fetal cells are not good. Um, we don't know the answer to that. So there's a lot of basic science that still needs to happen, and it'll certainly be disease specific. Thank you. I'm a little curious about how the diseases to be targeted are chosen? Does it come from the interest of the researchers? Does it come from patient groups? Does it come from mortality statistics? Where? So uh, I would say that all of the above. You stole my answer. <laughs> that was perfect. Um, so for me, I, I, I was a spinal cord injury researcher, only because my wife taught me how to be so. But we were working on spinal cord injury, and we, were, we went to a summer family camp where I met a uh, Iraq war veteran who'd been twice uh, injured in IED blasts and had traumatic brain injury. And meeting and talking with her, I was thinking, wow, you know, this is an, an, uh, a disease, an, an injury indication that is flying under the radar, but it's in fact uh, incredibly prevalent. And it actually caused me to shift directions in my lab. So it can happen from what type of patient you bump into to uh, Dr. Dr. Boda treats people with uh, glioblastoma. Um, that's her area of expertise. So it, it depends. Um, and then as funding gets tighter, the problem is sometimes people will target that thing that they think is most fundable rather than what's the best science. So um, one uh, thing that stuck out to me was the product that you mentioned that I believe you said is in early clinical trials here, but on phase four in Japan. Uh, with the rise of medical tourism, and it's probably, I'd expect to blow up in the future. Um, I would like to hear your guys' opinion uh, as the people performing the clinical trials here, uh, what is the relative safety of taking something that has been approved by the FDA here versus let's say Europe or Japan or in the international community? Well, I'll start because I'm not the clinician. Um, but, I, but Dr. Boda mentioned this, is that if it's been reviewed by the European Medical Board or it's been reviewed by Japan, I mean there are, uh, Company, countries that are just as legitimate as what we do in the U.S. Um, there are other countries where I wouldn't be so excited to go to, but I'll let Dr. Boda finish with that. I also think that you have to decide again about the severity of disease and the burden of proof. Japan has changed the legislation quite recently where treatments that here will be considered too early are now becoming marketable. And unfortunately, the government has decided not to share the data, not to allow the researchers to share the data as they used to do in the past. So I think that that will help the medical tourism, that will maybe help the government in Japan. I'm not sure that I feel comfortable to where they put the level of evidence. So going back, should I have a patient who's a very severe incurable disease that is trying to obtain that? I could not fault that patient. But going for a treatment for arthritis or for wrinkles, I might have an ethical problem there. And everybody needs to put their line of ethical dilemma where it belongs to them. So I'm going to suggest we take one more question, and then I'm sure Dr. Cummings and Dr. Boda will stay. So my father seen a big ad on a newspaper in receiving stem cell therapy for $5,000 um, to his knee in place of a knee replacement surgery. 
And so my question is, did I hear correctly, if it's you're paying for stem cell therapy, um, no stem cell therapy that you're paying for has been FDA approved yet? That is completely correct. For arthritis, there is no stem cell therapy approved. And then the other question that you should be asking yourself, what cells will be offered? Many times are adipose cells. Thinking that you can have an adipose cells creating tendons and cartilages, it's close to impossible. So are there complications with that? Yes, there are actually one of the stories that it's around here. It's about a patient that has received, published, this is not stories, those are not urban legends, are patients that try to get stem cell therapies in their joints and they got infected. And then there's another patient where the joint therapy was not effective and the patient agreed to have intravenous treatments with the stem cell, trying to reduce the inflammation. Those adipose cells then ended up with multiple infarct strokes and the patients went on machines and actually was brain dead. Yes. So you have to be very careful about those things. So these stem cells, they yeah. are using a, the umbilical cord of an infant. So then you have to still wonder, are they safe? Are they clean? Were the safety studies? There is no efficacy study, I can tell you that for sure. Mm -hmm. But even you have to question the safety, in my opinion. Or have you have experience regarding if, if, if there is a successful... Uh... The success, you know, again, is not judged on patient by patient. The success, as Dr. Cummings said, will be to go to that clinic and say how many patients you have treated, how do you measure improvement, have you published the results of your improvement, how many complications you had, what type of side effects the patients have seen, what clear data MRIs do you have showing that the cartilage or the tendons repaired on some patients was before and after data. If they are showing you that kind of data, then you have a base to think about it. But if all that you are seeing is what you ask, did anybody improve? then you are setting yourself for cases of one, where what if one person improved and 100 didn't? Would you still go? What about one person improved, 100 didn't, and 20 of them got infected and needed bigger surgery because now they had infectious arthritis? So I will, I would quickly add is that at last month's seminar, that's what I was gonna ask. <laughs> I'm gonna steal your thunder this time. So at last month's seminar, uh, an individual came up to Dr. Anderson afterwards and said, I've had two injections in my knee. The first one didn't do much, I wasn't really sure. I went back again and my knee swelled up and they actually ended up in the emergency room and had to be put on antibiotics because they had an infection. But that patient's testimonial that this didn't work and I wasted my money, I, I assure you that will not be posted on this company's website of here are the full story of what all of our patients are. You don't hear about the negative things. In, in fact, she came to ask me because she was being pressured by this clinic to go back again. Um, and Dr. Gala, behind you just pointed out, we do have a handout at the back um, that uh, Brian at least showed some of the links for. But one of the articles that's there, because Dr. Gala put it together, is um, particular from an orthopedic surgeon about um, stem cell therapies that are targeting an arthritis. And so that would be a good one to look at and have a read. So with that, I want to thank you all for coming tonight. Please thank our speakers. And I'm sure they'll stick around for a couple of questions if you need.